Hello, everyone. It's great to be back with you. And I'm, uh, my name is Kevin Bernhardt from UW Platteville, and I'm joined by two colleagues from UW Madison, uh, John Shutsky and also Mark Stevenson. Uh, and, uh, you know, last time that we had a conversation, we talked a little bit about some of the financial stresses that farmers are going to be facing potentially in the, the days and the weeks ahead. Certainly, we could spend a lot of time talking a lot more about those potential ones. But Mark, I want to throw a question out to you. Uh, you know, I, I can, I look at the micro farm quite a bit, but I've always been, um, I've always learned a lot listening to you talk about the industry it, itself, what, what is motivating the economics of the industry. And so I'd love to, to hear your thoughts and, and um, uh, how you're, what you're, forecasts are, so to speak, with respect to what's happening in the industry right now. All right. Well, thanks, Kevin. And I'd be happy to try to give you at least what insights I have uh, about all of this. You know, one thing I would say is uh, at the end of the year, there's an unending appetite for people to be thinking about forecasting what the year ahead is going to look like. And myself and every other forecaster that I know of was painting a cautiously rosy picture. Um, we had price recovery that happened that fourth quarter of 2019. The first month or two of, Jan of this year, 2020, looked fairly good. And we were expecting that to continue um, through the rest of 2020. And along came coronavirus. Boom. Uh, but we had some concerns uh, even before that. One of them was that the flush, that time of the year when we get more milk production than any other time of the year, was starting to look like it was going to be a big one. Um, we had a 1.7% increase in our February milk report, and that was going to keep the lid down a little bit on the optimism that we had for prices anyway. But when coronavirus showed up overnight, um, our markets really just fell apart. You mentioned earlier, Kevin, in the earlier segment that we've had quite a drop. If you look at that futures price opinion on May prices, it's been something like $5 a hundredweight on class three, $6 a hundredweight on class four. Um, the bottom has fallen out of prices here. And behind the scenes, the industry's changed. So when we all got the orders to stay at home, uh, as we're doing now and coming to you from our basements, one of the first things we all did was to run out and stock our pantries and our refrigerators with food and, yes, toilet paper. <laughs> uh, and when that happened, uh, you know, we had this, this vast change in our buying habits from out-of-home eating to uh, in-home dining. And those are different things. Um, we eat differently out of the home than we do in the home. And behind the scenes, the entire industry was scrambling. We had to get milk from plants that would make products um, for out-of-home eating into plants like fluid milk plants that uh, was going to satisfy the need for customers buying that extra gallon or two of milk at the store. That was a big scramble, and it's still taking place to some extent out here. Um, but you know, as all of that's happened, we now come to the realization that our refrigerators are full and people aren't buying quite what they used to. And in fact, dairy product demand has really kind of fallen precipitously. Um, by my estimates early on, I felt like we could have as much as a 5% decline in those prices or in the demand for milk and dairy products. But as we've gotten more information about just how bad demand has fallen apart, it looks like it could be, well, 10% or more. Mind you, these markets usually move by dollars, you know, with a 1% or a 2% change in either supply or demand, not a 10% change. This is devastating. No question about it. And what it's caused is um, from time to time, we're getting the reports that a farm has been asked to dump their milk. And that is uh, both a financial tragedy to someone. It may be spread across a lot of farms, uh, or it may be uh, actually held by a single farm under some circumstances, but it's an emotional uh, drain as well. Um, 
you know, I don't know, John, what do you do when, when you guys get emotional or have problems? You go out to eat on Friday night? Yeah, uh, fish I'm, fry? I'm missing my uh, fish fry and my, my Friday night old fashions. Uh, we don't make them as well at home. I don't, I haven't, I haven't even tried, but I do think, you know, you're right. It's, it's a distressing time to be putting that much work into your, to your land and to your animals. And, and, you know, you just hear so many stories of families that are just, you know, they're just really uh, torn at the seams with a lot of this stuff. But, you know, I've talked about this in some of the earlier segments, you've just got to be so careful to not let that stress just totally overwhelm you. And I always talk about, my dad had an old John Deere 4020. And when I, I remember being a little kid, I was like seven or eight years old. And I, I shouldn't admit this. My mom had a Chevy Impala 1962. And I knew I learned how to drive when I was like seven and I knew where the gas pedal was, but I could never understand the concept of the throttle fuel throttle. And so you got to kind of know with stress, you got to kind of know where those fuel throttles are. Um, you know, even when we're talking about these crises, like you're dumping milk, um, you're not able to get the loan and now we got to start planting crops. Um, it can be like really overwhelming. So this might sound a little bit simplistic, but those are times more than any other time when you've got to think of your body's like a machine, right? And your brain is like a computer and you'd never think of like trying to run a computer without plugging it in. Um, so we've got to be thinking about things like you mentioned fish fries. We may not be able to go out and do fish fries, but when you think of like your body as a machine, like you'd never go out and spend $600,000 on a forage chopper and then put crappy grade fuel in it. And yet that's kind of what we do when we get really stressed out. So making sure you're eating enough, um, decent food, um, decent food can include a candy bar once in a while. But if you're out planting corn and you've got a lunchbox that's full of Snickers bars and Mountain Dew, you're probably not going to be feeding the machine. So nutrition's important. Um, Sleep is an issue, so avoiding caffeine. Um, with COVID, um, I'm having a hard time sleeping. I'm making sure you've got a little bit of a sleep routine. This is a real problem, especially for our young producers, uh, waking up at three in the morning and checking, or, or midnight and checking your voicemail or whatever, so trying to practice good sleep habits. Another one, and you guys might think this is silly, but, um, because farmers get a lot of activity, but sometimes the activity is solely based around dealing with cows, you know, throwing equipment around and, and doing a lot of physical activity on the farm. But we do know that, that getting away with some type of exercise or activity, even if it's for 20 minutes and getting away from the work site, going for a walk with your spouse or your partner, um, doing something that you enjoy doing. I know I hate running, but I know some people out there love to run, but finding some activities like that, it gives you a different sense of perspective. I also try to get out to the woods because when I'm out in an oak forest, it kind of gives me a perspective of where I'm at in the universe. The last one I'll say is to try to slow down a little bit every day, even for 10 minutes. Um, some people call this meditation. I get a lot of farmers who's like, yeah, there's no way I'm going to meditate. But then I ask them, if you could be doing anything right now in the world, if you could wave a magic wand, what would you do? And I often get, I love, I live for the month of November and sitting in a tree stand deer hunting. And yet that's exactly why we do it. It's to get that quiet time to think and to put things into perspective. So just my little um, tips here on managing all of this crap that we're dealing with and the uncertainty and the unknown is just to make sure that you're taking care of yourself and doing that in a very thoughtful and purposeful way. You know, one so, thing that also strikes me, um, John and, and Kevin, is that I've talked to some producers too, and these are hardworking, proud people, right? Um, and I have the utmost respect for them. But if they're feeling like they're in danger of maybe jeopardizing the farm that uh, grandpa bought and, you know, dad built and, you know, I'm working on now, I think it's important that people realize that coronavirus is not your fault. This is something that's happened to everybody. I don't know how we process all of that, but, uh, you know, we're, we're all dealing with uh, something that was not anybody's fault. Uh, John, Mark, you've, you've 
prompted about another three hours worth of conversation that I would love to have here, but we are getting to the end of our segment. So, you know, I feel like uh, the, the meet the press person when I say you've got 30 seconds to answer this question. Uh, Mark, we, you, we have heard uh, at times that there may be this V-shape recovery where it's it everything went down really really fast but things will come back really really fast as well that's great optimism to have but i think we also need to plan for the risk as well um do you see that as a v-shaped recovery that we can look forward to or should we be prepared for something that could take some time to get back to quote a normal uh situation you know, I, V-shaped recovery means that we had a deep, severe plunge into low prices and that we could come just exploding back up out of that with all kinds of demand. It's possible, but I think it's less than likely. And the reason is that even after our um, health risks are reduced, that we've perhaps got a vaccine for, you know, the COVID virus or something else in front of us, we still are going to have an economy that's just lying on the floor and panting in what will surely be a recession. Um, and it will take some time to dig out of that. So, you know, I'm optimistic for a good, strong recovery and that we get back to our jobs, but I'm not sure that business as usual is what it's going to look like immediately after the health concerns are gone. I think that it's still going to be a bit slow in, in digging out of this. Kevin, I know we need to wrap, but I just, I think the other thing to consider, and I don't want to be a downer on this, but with these types of pandemics, and you go back to the, the Spanish flu of 1918, we often do see waves, and that's, you know, perhaps a wave in the fall, it may not be as bad, it might be worse, we don't really know at this point, but that's why the research and the science that's going into both vaccines to prevent and then therapeutics to lessen symptoms, or help it so that people are not nearly as infectious. Those are just really important variables that will predict our future. Right. Well, you know, this conversation reminds me a little bit of the circle of control and circle of non-control that every person has. A lot of the things that Mark talked about that are happening in the general economy worldwide as well as, as locally are those things that are in our circle of non-control. It's nothing that that the individual person could have done anything to prevent. Uh, and so, you know, keep those where they're at. Um, and those things that are within our control, many of the things that John talked about with uh, finding our throttles for being able to, to keep our stresses at a, at a point, at a level where we can make clear headed decisions. Those are the things that we can perhaps have a better control over and the precursor to making some good decisions in this tough times. So thank you, John. Thank you, Mark, for your insights and look forward to talking to you again and about other impacts from COVID-19. Very good. Thank you, Kevin.